Who are you? I am the last High Priest of the long extinct Daria race. Why does this alien sound like Bonsai Buddy? I am your friend and Bonsai Buddy. I have the ability to learn from you. The more we browse, search, and travel the internet together, the smarter I'll become. Recently, the second coming of Christ was delayed once again. But luckily, we also just happens to have two new cyberpunk games released around the same time. Ghost Runner and Transient. Unfortunately, neither of them are really that good, but since I've made it a point to talk about cyberpunk, Lovecraft, and horror on this channel relatively frequently, I kind of have to review Transient on principle, considering it's marketed as a cyberpunk Lovecraft horror game. The interesting thing about combining something like the Lovecraft universe with the cyberpunk genre is that when you sit down and think about it, both of these genres kind of have the same themes. Lovecraft deals with existential terror in the form of the unknown universe, and cyberpunk deals with existential terror in the form of socioeconomic political trends and emerging technology, but they're still at their core dealing with existential dread. Lovecraft and Cyberpunk also both feature healthy amounts of body horror. Lovecraft in the form of fish people and mutants, and Cyberpunk in the form of stretching what it means to be human. But looking at this guy is supposed to invoke the same feeling as looking at this guy. Both genres also heavily feature eldritch beings. Lovecraft prefers to write about unknowable interdimensional elder gods with physical and spiritual forms that aren't comprehensible to humans, while Cyberpunk tends to write about artificial intelligence in a similar way, as a higher, impossible to understand being. At the end of the day, if you're reading a Cyberpunk story that has actually been written well and you're interpreting it correctly, it should make you existentially horrified, which is sort of what Lovecraft was also going for. Given all of this information, it's easy to see how someone could have the idea to make the leap of combining these two fictional settings at some point. For better or worse, that point is now in the form of transient. Unless of course someone else did this first, at which point please feel free to call me a fraud in the comments. Gaming YouTube channels have to maintain their integrity. Normally in my reviews, I tend to start by going over a game's gameplay, because I generally think that's the most important part of a game, and it's the only part of the art form that other art forms definitionally can't do. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on what kind of a mood I was in while writing this script, there is very little to cover in terms of gameplay in Transient. It's more or less just a walking simulator with intermittent puzzles. Speaking of the puzzles, one of the first things that I noticed fairly soon is that the quality of the puzzles starts to deteriorate pretty quickly, and there are only about two that I would classify as a puzzle. Typically, puzzle solving just involves pressing the spacebar to scan the area when you're prompted, maybe pressing a button, and then leaving. And the farther you get into the game, the more simplified the puzzles seem to get, almost as if the game didn't quite have the time to flesh out its more complex ideas and clearly wasn't finished, but there will be more on that soon. Technically, Transient is intended to be a story-driven experience, so it would be unfair to come down on it too much for its lackluster gameplay. Unfortunately, Transient story is equally as lackluster, not necessarily because of the content of the story, but because of its execution, specifically how much of it was even able to be executed in the first place. Transient takes place in a pretty easy to understand cyberpunk setting. At some point in the past, there was an apocalypse event, and now all of humanity lives under one giant domed city, and passes the time by plugging their brain into the internet to escape the oppressive reality around them. Pretty standard. The game's protagonist is a member of a four-person elite hacking group that is involved with the practice of getting extremely high on hallucinogenic substances and using the increased perceptual capabilities to connect with cyberspace on a deeper level, which gives them more advantages to help them pull off their schemes. On top of this, there's also a bunch of Lovecraft shit going on, including semi-material jellyfish men, alleged interdimensional invasions, and elder gods. The part where things get complicated, though, are the layers of reality this game sets up. Transient starts with a base reality. 
And then people in this city can move their consciousness into cyber enclaves, which adds another layer. At one point in the game, we find out that it's possible to lose consciousness in a cyber enclave and go to a deeper level in another cyber enclave, like in that one movie you're all now thinking about. It's unclear how many levels deep a person can go, but we can assume it's probably several. Additionally, the main character has the rare ability to project his consciousness into the corners of the physical universe, which means other far-off planets that might be in places where the laws of physics operate differently are on the table, basically meaning base reality in and of itself is complicated. On top of this, the main character is also experiencing dreams that seem to be taking place in a realm that is partially material and partially immaterial, and it seems like this place can sort of be accessible through cyberspace if the main character takes the drug cocktail he has developed, which is very, very clearly based on ayahuasca. The game's lore notes even mention the act of hallucinogen in Ayahuasca, DMT, and make reference to its spiritual significance within the psychedelic revolution, calling it the spirit molecule. If everything that I just said in that sentence sounds like incomprehensible hippie bullshit, I'll explain it in more detail later, but for now, let's get back into the branching realities. Transient also makes mention several times of a dimension called Tehom, which is explained as being a purely immaterial dimension that only beings of a higher consciousness can get into. And finally, the game starts with the main character being brain scanned by the villain. So now we're kind of forced to assume that this complicated web of potential realities is probably inside the real cyber reality, which might be going on inside the real base reality, Maybe it's a nightmare, and the entire point of the game is that it's completely impossible at any given point to know which reality you're in. If this sounds like too complex of a setting for a game as simple as Transient, that's because it is. If you really wanted to tackle something this complicated, you would either need to just write a book instead of a game, or take the old school Obsidian RPG route and just have absolutely insanely rich dialogue and pieces of in-game story. Since this isn't a book review channel, we know Transient isn't a book, and since I've already exposed the game as being pretty mediocre, we know it didn't take the second route either. So what route did it take? Transient has the habit of just sort of dumping information on you in the notes that you can find around the game, and depending on which one you're looking at, they are about as transparent of a lore dump as is possible. This one is probably the worst example, where it's revealed that the apocalyptic event that almost destroyed humanity was an invasion of an elder race of beings that only partially existed in the material world that forced humanity to retreat to the Dome City. This is great, but man, I would much rather be playing this story than reading it. These lore dumps kind of give off the vibe of a bad tabletop DM explaining his D&D setting, but he constantly keeps interrupting himself by saying, Wait, I forgot to tell you that there are also all of these details about that previous information from several hours ago. The revelations in these notes feel less like reveals and more like yes ands in an improv class or something. They don't flow well in the context of the game because there isn't enough time to really flesh it all out and deliver it in a way that is paced out well. Part of the reason there is no possible way that Transient could have made this work is because it just isn't long enough to have done it. I'm not the kind of guy that judges a game based on its length, obviously. I just got done making a video that describes a 90 minute long game jam game as a masterpiece, so clearly I don't give a shit if your open world has 247 hours of gameplay, if that gameplay is garbage. That being said, the complexity that Transient is going for is just not possible to achieve in this short of a period of time, and I'm pretty sure the development team knew this and intended on the experience being much longer, but were unable to deliver on this for whatever internal reasons they had. I'm assuming budgets, or pressure from the publisher, or harsh deadlines, or some combination of the three. These are the kinds of things that really determine how a game is developed in real life. This game also just abruptly ends in a very strange spot, having answered none of the questions it poses and delivering on almost none of what it's set up. The opening cutscene is the player getting brain scanned by this guy, and the closing scene is the player doing this. No! 
And then the credits roll. It's an insane ending and very obviously was not supposed to be the actual end of the story that had been set up. As far as good things I can say about the game, as usual in a game like this, the art team was putting in the real work. The overgrown environments are very cool, the alien environments are very cool, the game definitely looks good. There are also two mini-games that are designed to feel like retro games which I really enjoyed, seeing as how much of an old man I am. The most frustrating thing about Transient though is that I think the team working on it, especially the writers, kind of see where things are going and were kind of making some good points. And it's unfortunate they didn't have more time to really get those points across. Right now, at least in developed countries like the United States where I live, we are seeing a complete revolution in how psychedelic drugs like psilocybin, DMT, MDMA, and so on are being perceived by the broader culture. This is what I was referring to earlier in the video when I said the psychedelic revolution. Along with this, we are seeing an increased interest in the older spiritual practices that sometimes involved these substances, either undeniably, as is in the case with ayahuasca in South America, or allegedly, as is the case with historic accounts of things like the Eleusidian mystery religion. This spiritualism also has modern analogs with various gurus of various levels of legitimacy writing influential books on a subject like this one. Oh look, it says spirit molecule right there on the book, like that thing I said before. The state of Oregon has long been respected by people from my home state of Washington for acting as a Soviet satellite state to hold off the influence of California but also recently just decriminalized most substances and legalized psilocybin for use in therapy. It's clear we are moving in the direction of these substances, achieving fairly broad acceptance in society, and it goes without saying that if their use continues to grow, we will almost for sure see a huge rise in spiritualism surrounding the use of them. On top of that, we are seeing technology continue to advance, and techno-folklore and pseudo-religions are starting to crop up around this as well. This is the second video in a row where I have referenced techno-folklore and not explained it, so maybe I should take a second to do that. The concept is very simple. Folklore will always be a reflection of the culture it comes from, and as every culture on Earth continues to get more and more technologically advanced, it stands to reason that in their myths and stories, technology will play a greater role. In the old days, stories used to say you needed to cast some kind of spell or do some ritual to talk to ghosts. Now the stories say all you need is the right machine. The two best examples of this are probably simulation theory and UFO folklore. Simulation theory, as much as it is sort of rooted in real mathematics, at the end of the day is a completely unfalsifiable claim, which means there is an enormous amount of room for people to develop religions and myths around the idea that we might be living in a simulation. There is no way we could have conceived of the idea of the universe being a simulation running on a machine unless we had machines that could run simulations. Folklore is naturally following advancements of the culture. UFO folklore also revolves around the as of so far unproven idea that technologically advanced aliens are observing and interfering with us in various ways. In previous times of human history, before we were sufficiently technologically advanced, the stories used to be about fairies and trolls living in the forest coming out to harass us. But now that we have progressed technologically, the fairies and trolls have turned into technologically advanced aliens. We never really stopped believing in goblins, we just gave them spaceships, because the new realm of the unexplained isn't the forest outside the village, it's the universe outside our planet. And of course, many people have made a religion out of this as well. Obviously, the specific example of UFO folklore and simulation theory are only two of hundreds of different ideas that I could talk about, but I think the two of them kind of help people understand what I mean when I say techno-folklore. It stands to reason, in my mind, that if we assume the two trends 
of psychedelic drugs and techno religion keep going in the same direction, eventually they will intersect, creating a culture similar to the one that exists in Transient, where there are groups of people who believe that by eating a fistful of the right mushrooms and plugging your brain into the right machine, you might be able to get some sort of understanding of the afterlife, or some understanding of the next stage of evolution, or some deeper, introspective understanding of yourself. Not only does the idea make sense, but it's compelling, and has all kinds of wild storytelling possibilities attached to it. The people writing Transient understood this very well. I just don't think they had the time or resources to really make it work well, or explain themselves effectively, or really put these ideas to the fire. I don't really blame them for it because there is a lot of shit going on here between the complexity of the universe they set up and the complexity of the real life aspects that influenced them, so the deck was kind of stacked against them. There is just no way that a studio as small as Stormling could realistically have been able to deliver such a can of worms in such a small package. And it could probably be argued that going into theming this complex in a video game sort of puts you at a bit of a disadvantage in the first place. The idea that maybe video games aren't the best place for extremely complex stories is probably going to be what they call a hot take, but that's fine. Whatever I have to do to get you people mad enough to leave comments on this video. All of this being said, I don't really know who I would recommend Transient to. It's not really a horror game, and there are better Lovecraft experiences, and there are also better cyberpunk experiences. Transient has unbelievably good ideas, and a very good understanding on the future of human folklore and religion, but none of it is executed well in the context of the game. I would love for whoever was the creative lead on this project to just convert this into a 700 page novel or something. If you want to see more videos like this one, consider subscribing. I really want to hit 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and I am very close, so just click the button. It's free. You can unsubscribe later. You should also follow me on Twitter so you don't miss any important updates. Also, I have a Discord community that you can join with a link down in the description, and we just started a Minecraft server for people in the Discord, so I guess you could say it's getting pretty serious. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.